in the winter this time with beautiful snow in the mountains. And I know it because I began learning about German wines. Uh, <laughs> it's much more fundamental. Uh, so here's the Eiffel and here's Monschau. And I remember we visited Monschau and then we went down. That's where Eiffel, that's where Christoffel grew up. And you go down the mountains and you come to the Mosel. Mosel is a river in Germany called Mosel. En français, is Mosel, but uh, here it's called Mosel. <laughs> and if you, uh, so I think of this Christoffel in, in 1880 and so on, young man, your age, I, I don't, you, you can look up his age, I, I don't remember. But um, anyway, it's very interesting, he grew up here and you know where Cologne, Cologne is, Cologne is someplace, uh, Cologne, Cologne, Bonn is here, Cologne is maybe here, <laughs> yes, and I don't know the situation, but they're very fine gymnasium, high school, so gymnasium like 
you, you, in Köln. And he went from Monschau as a young boy to this gymnasium and learned in gymnasium mathematics in Köln. And uh, I went to, so he, he went to Köln to gymnasium and, uh, and I'm sure was motivated to study mathematics there by a great teacher like Mr. Benz. <laughs> you see, Mr. Benz, for example, studied mathematics in Bonn. Mr. Benz, second Staatsexam uh, advisor, was a man named Klingenberg. Klingenberg is one of the leading differential geometry people of his generation. <laughs> well, he said, oh, he's a bright because he had. But you see, your, your teacher had contact with top level mathematics. That's a fundamental point. Not just some fooling around. So, the uh, curl is, this is curl. And, oh, I wanted to say about Lanschein, because Lanschein, here's the Mosel. And, and uh, Lanschein is not on the Mosel, but the Mosel is a very interesting river, because the Mosel connects to the Rhine. Yes, you know that you've heard the word the Rhine. And there's a little place here, right on the Rhine, where my desk is, and I have a view of that to work every day of this beautiful river. So that's a more or less true picture. And I started to say, if you go down here more or less to the, to the Mosel Valley, uh, you come to a small town called Velen. And one of the beautiful uh, hills in Velen is where wine goes, is called Velen of Zonen. Or maybe you've heard of it, it's very nice. If you're beginning to drink, uh, drink wines as your specialty, you should start with a light Mosel wine like this. And uh, it's and not too sweet. And uh, you do that. And, yes. And now I have to worry a little bit about my geography. But someplace here is another nice river, which, by, by the way, goes up toward towns like Marburg and so on, it's called the Lahn, L Lahn. <laughs> Here's the Lahn. And the Lahn goes, oh, oh the, the, this is the Mosul, you see, this is the Mosul here, coming into the Rhine, and here's Koblenz someplace, and here's the Lahn, and right here is Lahnstein, and Lahnstein is the gymnasium, Johannes, Johannes Gymnasium, high stuff, and the young people from Johannes Gymnasium, is a wonderful, beautiful uh, gymnasium with wonderful students and wonderful teachers, and they're visiting Jakobs today to find out how nice it is here. <laughs> That's it. And so Christoffel grew up in Monschau. You have to understand, think of this, grew up in a small town, Monschau, went to a gymnasium in Köln to experience the real life, and then after that went to Berlin, where he studied mathematics in particular, Berlin is in this picture someplace. <laughs> Berlin is over here. <laughs> Berlin. And uh, after doing his, what we call Abitur, so that's, if you don't know the German system, that means like you graduate from high school. That's what all these young people more or less finish now, yeah? I hope. <laughs> he went to Berlin, studied mathematics, and one of his main teachers, trying to emphasize culture, not just some technical stuff. One of his main teachers was a man named Dirichlet. Now that's interesting, this name Dirichlet. Do you know the connection with his family and the family of Mendelssohn? And maybe you know the music, uh, the music of Mendelssohn, or by the way, not, maybe not, not just the famous Mendelssohn who was a white uh, man, but his sister who was a very non-trivial composer also. Yes, and maybe you know the generations before of Moses Mendelssohn. Maybe you've heard of the great culture of this family. And Dirichlet was involved in this family. So this guy went from, Mo from Monschau to Köln to Berlin to Dirichlet. Dirichlet you may not know for mathematical physics or differential geometry. You know him for other things, maybe number theory, for example. But he was a very broad mathematician, as people were, were in that day. And he did his work with Dirichlet there. 
And after he finished his first degrees, he went back to Monschau. <laughs> he went back to Monschau from Berlin. You have to understand what that means. There's this big city. There is Dirichle. There is Riemann from Göttingen influencing the, the this is before, the, the influence of uh, Riemann was before, Weierstrass. These people, tremendous mathematics, he went back to Monschau and stayed for two or three years in Monschau, in a little quiet town in the mountains with snow and going down to Valen and having a glass of white wine. But he didn't just sit there, he sat there and thought. He sat there and thought for two or three years about Riemannian geometry and reading the collected works of Riemann. And he then went back to Berlin and did his next step, it's called Habitation in German, became a very famous, very important mathematician. Keep that in mind. Keep in mind culture. In fact, I would say German culture in this case. Yeah. Keep in mind sitting someplace and really thinking about something, trying to understand. Yeah. This is what this guy did. You may see his work. You will see it was something very famous that I'm going to talk about. <laughs> and physicists, I noticed there's some physicists here. They know this, the physicists know this. The physicists can calculate fantastically, so they calculate with Christoffel symbols. That's a Christoffel symbol. He invented this because it's really some sort of a tensor. We now know what it is, but he invented, it. He invented the notion tensor, if you're interested in mathematics. He invented really the exterior algebra. He invented all of these things for reasons of mathematical physics. And he invented them having read the works of Riemann in particular. So that's a little story about Lanstein, Monschau, Köln, Berlin, and mathematical culture. Einstein said that the discovery of non-Euclidean geometry was the second Copernican revolution. This is an exact quote of Einstein. And Einstein, Einstein was a physicist, of course, and magnificent in computing and doing these things and so on. Uh, Einstein should not have formulated it in that way. I think a better formulation is the second Copernican revolution is the discovery of what is geometry. So you should ask, what is geometry? When I was your age, I was younger, but I was very, very lucky. I was 16 or 15, and in my high school, we went through the works of Euclid, a modern Hilbert version of, Hilbert was a great German mathematician, Hilbert wrote Euclid's geometry in a modern way so we could understand it and we spent one year looking at an axiom, derive a definition, proving a theorem, and so axiom one, there exists a point, axiom two, for every every point there's a line not through the point. Remark one, Ax lines and points are not, are undefined objects, yes, Euclid. Excuse moi, Euclid. What is Euclid? 400 BC? Yes. So this was the first version of geometry. And in some sense, this, in Hilbert's version of this, originally for, for us, and you should read it, it in his Abhandlung de Mathematik, there's an uh, Abhandlung de Geometry, there is an appendix about geometry. And he's interested in in surface geometry or two-dimensional geometry. And he's interested in the geometry of the sphere, the geometry of the plane, and one other geometry, maybe of a hyperbola or something. Yes. These are we will learn what these geometries are. These are the geometries of the constant curvature. Uh, simply connected manifolds of constant uh, surfaces of constant curvature. So Hilbert was interested in those things and and also was interested in Euclid's stuff. And so we saw something like, like this. Yes. Well, I think uh, everybody here uh, 
uh, likes to look at a sphere. You look at a sphere. And everybody here nowadays has been in an airplane, right? I think. At least I fly a lot back and forth to the United States these days. And you know these modern things in the airplane. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, if you're in the airplane, and here's your monitor here, and you're, you're trying to watch movies, but you can also occasionally check out where you are, right? And you start here in Frankfurt, and you, you fly to, uh, to New York City, here. This is Frankfurt. And here's maybe New York City. Um, I'm not sure you ever thought about this. You know there's such a thing as north and south. Long, longitude and latitude, I always forget which is which, right? So do, you, uh, <laughs> do you have a feeling how far north is uh, San Francisco, uh, New York City? Do you have a feeling? Where it is compared to Frankfurt? On the north-south scale. Have you ever thought about it? Well, here's Germany, and here's the Schweiz. Here I am in summer in, the, in, that, in Südtirol. And here is Italy. And here is Roma. And here is more or less Napoli, here almost on the coast. Uh, New York City and Napoli are the same longitude almost exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And I've forgotten how it looks, but I think when you're, you're here, you look like you're doing this. And it, right on the monitor, it looks like that. Isn't that true? I think, I think so. And in fact, it looks at one of the things, it's very precise. Here you go over uh, here. Here is uh, Halland, Nova Scotia and so on. Here is Greenland. You actually go over a corner of Greenland. Maybe you touch by Iceland. You go over uh, 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 England in some sense, maybe Ireland. You go like that. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Yes. That, yeah, that is that. And here is Frankfurt. And here is New York. And here is, here is that. And we, on the sphere, that is some special thing we know, you, you all know what that word is called, it's called a geodesic on the sphere. Right? It's the shortest path on the sphere. That's the naive way of discussing what is a geodesic. It's the shortest, it's the path of shortest distance, the geodesic. Geodesic looks curved. I hope you've been in museums and you've seen the old cartographer. You know the word cartography, I hope. The old cartographers. By the way, uh, I hope you know that this, in, uh, in English, we have a, a, this chunk here, this chunk here we put over here on page, on page 75 of, of the Big Mac, right? And you look, in the old days we had maps, we didn't have Google Maps, but in, in the old days, in the old days we had maps and we look on page 75 and there's Frankfurt and there's, uh, maybe if we're lucky, we get everything on one page, right? And the old cartographers made these maps by hand. It's very interesting to try to understand what these things are going on. So this thing, this whole thing here is called a chart in English. And this thing that goes from the sphere, the real thing, that we're interested in studying, uh, to, the, to the page 75, and, and we used to call it the atlas, didn't we? Uh, this thing over here, all the pages together, together in this book over here, uh, is called the atlas. Mr. Benz and I will know, we called it the shell atlas in the old days. It was as big as always the shell atlas, right? At least in, in West Germany, I think in Eastern Germany it was that it was, in Eastern Germany, it's very hard to get a map because the communist government did not want us to see what was going on. My favorite gifts to my good friends in Moscow when I would visit Moscow before uh, the Vende, before the turn of the, in the East and West Germany, my favorite gift was a map of Moscow because my Moscow friends did not have a map. Anyway, this is an atlas. This is this whole thing here is a chart. And the interesting thing is here in the English language, this. This thing is called a map. Yes. 
So the whole guy there is going from there to there, and the whole picture is called a chart. The whole thing of all these charts is called an atlas, and the thing that does it is called a mapping. And in German, it's the same thing. It's called Abildung. Yeah? That's, it's the same word. It's an exact translation of the word mapping. Abildung, mapping, same word. That's very interesting. I know you're Romanian. I'd be interested to hear about it. In French, the word is application. In Romanian, probably the same. Something like, like that, right? right? The origin of application is, in English, you know the word application. And it must be related, you apply it and you get this. Yes, I don't know, but it's called application. So in English and German, this is, this is the same word. It's called abdino. This thing is called karte. And this thing is called atlas. So that's the situation. Yeah. And if you take a curved object, and you apply this mapping to make the atlas using this chart, you screw up everything in slang of my home, my home uh, lingo. You screw it up in slang of American English. It's, I can use it nowadays. It was, in the old days, I could not say this in Germany. Uh, less, uh, screw up is uh, another word of saying is mess up. You mess up the real geometry by putting it into a flat picture of the real geometry. Yeah. And you want to understand this flat picture. Everybody understands lines from Euclid. Everybody understands points from Euclid. Everybody understands triangles from Euclid. And then you have side angle side and these axioms and go blah, 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 and you prove theorems. Hypotenuse, and I, I don't know, all of these things. Even Descartes is much later, but still, you have some way of measuring. But that is something else. You screw it up because you did not understand what was going on here. You didn't understand it. Now, the first person in the, 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 the general area of mathematics, the first person to truly really push understanding in mind of, of this picture here, um, in, in my background, historically probably not, is this guy. <coughs> By the way, somebody was asking about applications yesterday. Who was that guy? Was that? <laughs> Gauss uh, was interested in all sorts of stuff that you would call applications. He also knew, you know about Gauss. He was interested in the curvature of the Earth. He was interested in astronomy. He was a chief astronomer. Uh, he was interested in all sorts of stuff. But he was interested in understanding what's really going on here. Right? So he was interested in understanding what really was going on for a situation like this, where you had this guy here, uh, is embedded, do you understand the English word, this, this, this thing is embedded in three-dimensional space, right? The sphere is embedded in three-dimensional space, we see it, yes? And because it is covered with these many charts, uh, and these charts are put together in some way with this atlas, in a decent way, the way they're put together is good. Google Maps does it better nowadays. This thing is called an embedded manifold. <clears throat> if you are German, keep the translation of manifold. I'm not sure which way it goes. I'm, I think the English word exists, both words exist in parallel in the usual language. But the word is manifaltigkeit. Yeah, it's the same word. It's exactly the same word. It can be used, and it can be used in every day. If if you are a scholar, an intellectual, a German, you would talk about Manifaldigkeit uh, Leidenschaften. Yeah, something like that. Many properties of something. It means manifold. You just you can just say it manifold. It's manifold. Yeah. 
This manifold is embedded in three-dimensional space. <clears throat> it is the sphere with curvature embedded in a three-dimensional space with many charge. Page 75 I wrote for you. Page 76 it'll look different and so on. And these charts, if you could glue them together, you would build up this manifold again. We have learned about this in mathematics. We have been precise about what it means to glue these things together. It should be good. You shouldn't just cut and paste. You should glue them smoothly together and everything's okay. And Gauss was fixated, I would say. Do you know the word fixated? Fixated, I'll tell you. In, in negative in, it, in, in, the, in negative sense, it means uh, he was completely focused, also in a positive way, on embedded surfaces in three-dimensional space. So that really what we are seeing in curvature, although Gauss tried and succeeded to a certain extent to understand something, the curvature that we're seeing here really has to do with the three-dimensional space. If I recall correctly, well, it doesn't matter. But he, he was even it was realized this young boy was greatly talented in mathematics, but he was he was sick a lot of the time. And I think his family didn't have much money, and I think he was supported by the Catholic Church by priests, as was usual to help him uh, get through his things, educate himself, and went to Göttingen. So his name is Bernhard Riemann. not being careful about the dates, but the, the interval in the mid-19th century. And Riemann became a student of Gauss. It is very interesting to look at Gauss's uh, uh, evaluation of Riemann. Gauss is a good German word. Many of you are Germans. I like the word muffy. <laughs> Der war ganz Riemann. Uh. Finally, I think he supported Riemann in a good way. <laughs> but, Gauss, uh, but Gauss was looking at these surfaces and in, in, in trying to understand curvature, trying to understand geodesics, trying to understand, I'm going to use another word here, what is called parallel transport, what it means to go from one, I talked about an airplane, what it means to go from one place to another on a manifold. Let me say these words that, that Gauss sort of was looking at, and Riemann began looking abstractly. Highly non-trivial given the times, I think. Because the student, this young student told Gauss, hey man, you're always looking at these things sitting in three-dimensional space. These things are abstract manifolds. These things are abstract objects that you should be considering abstractly. You're really messing up your mind by looking at these things in three-dimensional space because looking at them in three-dimensional space has nothing to do with it. Ah. Oh. 
I'll say, come on, I have something to do with it. I can figure out, I can, if I'm in an airplane, Gauss said, if I'm in an airplane, I, you know, 1840 or something like this, if I'm in an airplane, I can turn on the monitor and I can figure out what the geodesic is, what the heck do you think? Riemann demanded that. Riemann said we should look at n dimensional manifolds, where n is arbitrary. Shocking. That's an abstract concept. That means you have an, an object that has charts. It has charts as the whole thing here. It has an atlas, all these pages you put together. These things are glued together in a decent way. And, you bit, and these things are all n-dimensional. So this thing you see, this picture here, is contained in the plane, which is R2. But when it's n-dimensional, uh, 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 it's contained in Rn. You put together pieces which are glued together in a decent way, contained together in Rn. <clears throat> These are the fundamental objects of all of mathematics. Applied mathematics of climate, climate work, our colleague works in climate uh, research, of Highly applied mathematics here. They have combinatorial mathematics, which Kavon works on because this, these things are put together in some combinatorial way, etc., 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 etc. Riemann realized this. He had one idea in this area. He had many ideas, but in this area, he had this one idea. The right thing to look at is an n-dimensional manifold. Forget this embedding. You will not understand what's going on if you're thinking about this embedding. Please try to understand what is curvature. Please try to understand what is a geodesic. Please uh, try to understand what you are doing without standing around in, in three-dimensional space. Yeah. That's what Riemann did in the mid-19th century. We are standing on the shoulders of giants, and he is one of the giants. Yeah. God, I don't know about that. And Christoffel, when he went back to Monschau for those three, two or three years, I'm not sure when, he devoted his time to studying the collected works of Riemann. Thinking. In a peaceful way, thinking. We should do this more nowadays. So I'm going to list uh, some words now that I will discuss. By the way, you've seen, I have done no computation. I have done written, except for this Christoffel symbol, which I wrote there as a joke. I have done only discussion of concepts. And I will tell you about Riemannian geometry, and I will tell you about, it's really transparent in Riemannian geometry. The technical computations of Riemannian geometry until the recent years, which became a subject, in some sense, of partial differential equations. The technical comp computations in Riemannian geometry are computations in what I call ordinary differential equations, and particular, very simple-minded ordinary differential equations. It's just a bunch of terrible computations, and you pick up a book and you look at all these terrible things, you hate it. Yes. So what you need to understand is the concepts. Because if you understand the concepts, you just go ahead and do the calculation. Do you get what I'm saying? You need to understand what the concepts are. I'm going to write some of the words on the board. What are the concepts? I think, historically, the first thing I should write on the board is what is called a Riemannian connect, uh, metric. And Riemann certainly discussed this matter and was talking about this matter here. And he says to the guys 
of the ancient times who have been measuring you know, with, with measuring uh, so many kilometers and all this measuring. A Riemannian metric is something much more than you think it is. I'm going to talk about what is a Riemannian metric. It is not just a measuring stick. Okay? Riemannian metric is not just a measuring stick. It is a deeper concept that gives you a measuring stick, but it's a deeper, important concept. And as the name indicates, my understanding is that Riemann completely understood the importance of this concept and introduced it. And then around the beginning of the 19th century, Uh, beginning of 20th century, there's a very fundamental observation of a number of people. They had a great deal of difficulty expressing themselves in the notation of the time. They understood the notion of a connection. Now, I'm going to talk about that today, but that's what you should think of that as because you will, you will immediately understand what it means a Riemannian metric, and you will not immediately understand what it means a connection. I'm going to talk about it. It's a deep concept. Okay. Let me just say, if you have a Riemannian metric, whatever it means, you automatically get a connection which is canonically associated to this Riemannian metric, but conversely not. And these connections are really, really the things that you're really using in geometry. Let me just tell you one of the things that you get from the... Oh, and let me just tell you the, the guys who were involved here at the turn of the century, roughly. And I love the two countries, namely Germany and Italy, so let me read... Uh, and I, I grew up... My Italian, my Italian growth is in the Toscana, Bologna and Scuola Normale Pisa, and these people, Ricci and Levi Civita, Great important contributions there, and Christophe. Here we go. And here, uh, the notion of an n dimensional manifold. Here we should like to work. And maybe this time distance is one generation. Let me emphasize the internationality. This was called Bremen International University in the old days. And the importance of internationality, I believe in. So let's go down. Let's go down. Romania? Germany? India? India? Germany? Germany. Ger oh, too many Germans. <laughs> India or uh, uh, Nepal? Yeah. Nepal? Yeah. Germany? Yeah. Even Bremen? And so on. Nepal? Moldavia? South Korea? You get what I'm talking about? China? Yeah? You get what I'm talking about. China, yeah. USA. Yeah. Internationality brings, brings food, in my mind. And one thing to emphasize here is the Riemann, by the way, his grave is in the, you know, the beautiful seas of northern Italy. One is called the Gardense, the another one is called Lago di Como, uh, and so on. His grave is there. By the way, I think I haven't visited his grave, but I've heard it's in bad condition, so I'm worried about it. So maybe we should sometimes go down there and clean up his grave. I'm not sure. <laughs> the reason he's, he's buried there is he died very young man of tuberculosis, and in th those days they didn't have antibiotics or anything, so he, the solution was to go to, the, uh, to uh, the Alps, the Italian Alps, for example, and get the good air and, and so on. He died a young man, and he, that's the reason, I think the reason he's there. But anyway, Riemann believed in uh, internationality, and he visited Italy and vice versa. He established a beautiful connection between Italian mathematics and German mathematics. I profited immensely from it, my home south. And he uh, had a good friend here. The students will know this name very well. And he told this guy what to do in mathematics. 
named Betty, and Riemann was the first, uh, and I'll use a mathematical word, Riemann was in some sense the first apologist, and uh, uh, he told Betty what to do in, 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 in the initial parts of a subject called algebraic topology. And Betty, Betty had very good contacts with somebody named Bianchi, and we will have Bianchi. We will talk about some of Bianchi's observations here with these connections. And these people were all connected here, ironically connected, here in the Toscana. Uh, so it's very important, the internationality. Once you have a connection, you know what it means, parallel transport. And that brings me to the mathematical beginning of my lecture. What could it mean, parallel transport? Do I have time to talk to, oh, let's see, 9.30, yeah. I can talk about mathematics for 15 minutes. Well, let's say that we have a vector here. Uh, everything, everybody's cool with vectors. <laughs> we have a vector here, and Mr. Benz talked about vectors, I'm sure. Somebody at lunchtime talked about vectors. We all talk about vectors. Maybe we have a point here I call x0. Maybe we're even thinking of x0 as being a point on a manifold. And maybe we are thinking of the vector somehow as being a tangent vector here to the manifold. You can imagine, tangent. Right? And maybe we're over here at x1. And you're at some Grundschule, some elementary school here in Bremen, and you go out there and ask a kid, like my grandson, Frederick, I always mention him, he's very sharp. So I asked Frederick, how, Frederick, how do you translate this vector from over here, from here to here? So this vector may be here, V. This vector here. By the way, there's a very good expression in the English language, I, in the German language, I don't know it in English. This point where this, this, point where this vector is starting out is called a Fußpunkt. I don't know, your high school background, did you call it something like that? Oh, I didn't either. You probably have more British uh, type education. I think in the, in the English type of education, we didn't call it a, you call it a Fußpunkt probably, yeah? This is German. From Humboldt's Huh? No, you're not from Humboldt. Yeah. Uh, yeah, near there. Hmm? Yeah, nearby. Nearby. Yeah. I am uh, <laughs> better than Humboldt. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Fußpunkt. And you translate it over here. And if Frederick would do that, I think he would draw that picture. If you ask my five-year-old grandson to take that vector at that Fußpunkt and translate it over here, and he would say this would be parallel transportation of from, from going from x0 to x1 uh, of the vector v is the vector W. Okay? The ability to parallel transport a vector from one place to another. Who would ever think that that's important? Who would ever think that that's important? Well, if you're going around here, and you have a vector here, and you transport it over here, and you transport this picture over here to this thing, it's not going to be Frederick's picture. Parallel transport is exact a reflection of curvature. Parallel transport is exact the reflection of curvature. How when you translate some things parallel somehow is a reflection of curvature. 
Parallel transport reflects curvature. Parallel transport is not what Frederick does. What Frederick does is parallel transport in the plane, in the flat plane, where everything is flat. Now, Riemann understood this. Riemann formulated this in some very obscure language. It's so extremely difficult and obscure. He said, in order to understand this in dimension four, Riemann. In, other, in, in dimension four, We need ten numbers to understand this. This is a quote of Riemann. <laughs> we need ten numbers to understand what is. So at each point, you have some number, ten numbers which is telling you somehow what parallel transport is going to be. He didn't, was not able to write it down. I, as far as I can tell, I did not read his manuscript, but as far as I can tell, he could not write this down in the language at the time. But it is parallel transport that does really tell you what is going on with the curvature. And the people who were able to understand this at the beginning were Ricci, Levi Civita. Uh, by, by the way, Levi Civita is one person. Levi <laughs> dash Civita. Maybe it's like nowadays, you, you get married and then you, you're, you take on the name of the other person. Half of it. My daughter has a double name. Isn't that great? With a long name like Huckleberry, she married a German guy, so her name is Krause Huckleberry. It's very good. <laughs> it's wonderful. Lady Chi, I put a dash here, not a dash. That has been the image. They understood it. I'd like to talk about it. Differential geometry <clears throat> has to do with differentiation. Isn't that nice? We do integrate a bit because we occasionally want to find volume or surface area or something like that. But this primarily, at the beginning, is solving equations which involve der derivatives, understanding the meaning of derivative. Okay. Now, I want to, in the presence of your high school teacher and in the presence of all these other people, to tell you that we have terrible education in high school about what is a derivative. I'll say it out loud. I'm proud to say that we have terrible back, I too, we have terrible education about what is a derivative. And not only that, we have terrible education about what is a function. <clears throat> this was a breakthrough about what is a function, right? We have terrible education about what is a function. Let's talk about this geometrically. Everybody knows an axis. <laughs> if it's horizontal, maybe that represents something, but that's usually the domain of definition of something, right? That's the domain of definition. Let's say this is the time axis, and let's call the, the variable there t. And then you learn what is a function. You learn what is a function. A function, for example, is a function of time. For example, if I have the time axis here, t, I have a function or a mapping backwards 
from the, an interval here to the flight that we took. Or I look at it here in a chart, maybe it's that. I have a function, or mapping, back into the manifold. It's very interesting, mappings into the manifold, mappings out of the manifold. This is mapping into the manifold. It's mapping of the time interval into a curve. This is a curve, a smooth curve. Everything is smooth, we can say what it means. And we say at a certain point, T0, we are here, and that's the value of our function. And, and then it goes on, and it's a smooth function, so it looks nice. And at T1, uh, it's here, and, and that's, that's, that's it. So by definition, that's what we learn in our basic axioms, it looks like a graph. Right? Right? Now, suppose that we have, as Einstein knew, a curve in space, in our room here, okay? A curve. So that, that maybe is what this is. This is a space, this is space, this, this is space. Space had, has various properties. I mean, uh, there are physicists people who know much better than I do here, but you talk about all sorts of deep properties of space, right? Gravitation and so on. I mean, really a lot of deep, really deep properties that I don't understand. Yeah. Now watch. Watch very carefully, and this is why I'm saying I have bad math education. The math education about what is a derivative in high school is bad. The definition of a function is bad. We should change the whole thing to make a revolution. Yes, we should make a revolution, a political revolution of climate research and bad functions. This at time t0 is some space at time t0. This is time t1 is some space at time c1. This is some at time, time two to t2. This is some space at time t2. Right? This is a, a graph of a mapping into spaces. This is very nice. As we move in time, we move along this graph. This is a time up. Oh, I want to differentiate this function. Oh, this function I call f. Oh, now what about f? Uh, I say I want to differentiate. This is Mr. Benz teach you about derivative, and I teach my students about derivative, and, um, and, and so on. And we say, well, we make a small, we make a small earthquake here, t plus t0, t, I move it by a small earthquake, and I move over here, and here's the value, so I, I, I make the small earthquake. That's the earthquake, and then I subtract off your board, because you've seen this in kindergarten, it's board. Uh, and I subtract off that, and I divide by that, and I take the limit. And then I go home and have a, have a Berliner, because John Kennedy went to Berlin and said, Ich bin ein Berliner. I go home and have a Berliner and a cup of coffee and smoke, drink a cognac at night, and I'm happy. Drink a Mosel wine. And everybody says, this is a derivative. Then you're at home uh, drinking your cognac and having uh, your young people. You should be drinking wine. You're, later on when you're old, you should drink co uh, cognac. Well, I used to drink wine and cognac, but now I'm getting <laughs> <laughs> But if it's good cognac, it's, it's uh, you know. <laughs> What's wrong with that? That is complete nonsense. Let me say it again. This is the first concept 
in Riemannian geometry. And if you get it, you've gotten the first constant. At time t0, you're at the space here. At time t1, you're at the space here. At time t2, you're in the space here. You're moving along with these various spaces. And, and you say, well, this guy is in, in this, space, this space, and I take it in that space, and I subtract off that. How in the hell can you track, subtract off two things that are not in the same bloody space? They're not in the same space. They are not in the same space. Right? Now you may say, okay, that's a copy of the real numbers, but Einstein says, or, or say the three-dimensional space or whatever, he says these spaces have different qualities at different times. Right? So it's a space with structure, with different qualities. You can... It's a copy of, of the three-dimensional space. If you have something in three-dimensional space, you just subtract it. It's no problem. But these spaces are not comparable. They are not in. They are not the same space. Let me. You draw the picture. You can draw the picture for me here. Space of tangent vectors here looks like that. Space of tangent vectors here looks like that. Cartesian tangent vectors here looks like that. All over the sphere, they are not the same space. Right? They're completely different spaces. How can you subtract two numbers that are in different sets? I ask you that. How can you do that? You cannot do that. 